It's often assumed that the Magnum tradition is about the subject matter, that photographers are driven to tell stories about the world and uh, communicate issues that interest and concern them. But really what the Magnum tradition is about is making compelling pictures. They're, they're picture makers. What's special about Magnum, among many other things, um, is the variety of voices in the group, in the collective. Um, so if you talk about street photography for Magnum, you actually are talking about something that is extremely plural. Um, street photography at Magnum is not, thing, not one thing that you can define um, very easily. I think you have to look at everybody case by case and look at what street photography meant for each and every one of them. What is street photography? I, I don't have any sophisticated definition of that. It's what people produce in public settings uh, where there's people around and you're, you're improvising, uh, thinking, responding, dealing with people, uh, and, 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 and making pictures, in, uh, discovering pictures in public settings as distinct from planning pictures or going on a, on a very particular storytelling shoot. You're, you're open to the possibilities around you. We think of street photography as images dealing with how private lives intersect in a public space. And those relations are different in different parts of the world. So where you're working really affects what you see and what can be done with photography on the street. I think every photographer um, should think of this kind of define what the street means to them in their own way. Like there's no one way of defining street photography. I, I'm at, at wit's end of how to define it. I, I said one time that you can smell the street and feel the dirt, okay? But I, I don't think there's any um, real definition of street photography, okay? It's, it, there's a feeling of the street, okay? And it could be a photograph with people, it could be a photograph without people, okay? Um, maybe very clean. Um, it's just when I see it, I know it. But to put a, a pigeonhole it and say this is the definition of street photography, uh, it's very hard for me to do and I, I've thought about it, okay? To my mind, because I think I've been inspired by so many forms of photography, street photography has a somewhat different definition and it becomes a part of my interest in photography as a whole. To me, photography should be the intersection point between all these different kind of languages of photography. Sometimes you're on the street and you want to stop someone and get really close and take a beautiful portrait. Um, sometimes it may be shooting from the hip unobtrusively. Sometimes it may be waiting at a street corner very conspicuously for all sorts of elements to align. Sometimes street photography might just be taking a photograph of of a discarded piece of trash. In a nutshell, I don't think of street photography in, in, in these narrow terms. I think that photography is at its best when it's channeling all these kinds of different forms of, of looking at the world into one kind of cohesive, but also uh, spontaneous whole. There are many tones and levels um, in street photography you have the humorous street photography, and you can think of Martin Parr and Elliot Erwitt. And there's the very poetic and um, romantic street photography, and there I'm thinking more of photographers of Magnum who have been working on street photography in a more um, painterly way, I would call it. So looking for light and colors um, and shapes the way a painter would be playing with his palette. Um, and this is really um, quite remarkable to observe um, how they function, how they use their camera to look at those lights and shadows. P Pinkasov, of course, ver very influenced by Tartowski, uh, Ari Gruyer by maybe more by Flemish uh, painters. Um, and the result of it is a very painterly, very classic sort of 
um, body of work that is street photography, but it's more um, abstract abstraction taken from reality. Cartier-Bresson in the 30s, particularly his work in the 30s, is absolutely mesmerizing because of that poetry and because of the fact that he was in no control at all. He was taking photographs, um, very much based on serendipity and things were coming together and there's something very much um, impossible to explain about the magic of how things came together for him. But certainly when you look at his work in the 30s in Mexico and Spain and Italy, um, there's a wind, sort of a wind of mysticism that is floating in his photographs. Um, and I think it is it was an utter sense of freedom. And it's no wonder that many photographers, um, many of the famous photographers took their most beautiful photographs, not to say that they were the only beautiful photographs, but in their 20s. And I think it comes with that sense of freedom. So one of the most famous concepts, most well-known, most iconic concepts for street photography, for photography in general, and that defines very much um, street photography is the decisive moment, which is an etiquette label that pretty much um, has been sticking on Cartier-Bresson for a long time because the title of the book in English was The Decisive Moment. It was in French, Image à la Sauvette, which literally means images on the run. Um, and Agnès Cyr, the director of the Henri Cartier-Bresson Foundation, has been in the past few years um, arguing and demonstrating that really the decisive moment was not something that Cartier-Bresson was talking about so much as the title of this book that then became a brand almost um, that was attached to Cartier-Bresson when in fact there was something very limiting in that. On a d'ailleurs dans les archives toute une série de de titres qui ont été proposés par euh, Cartier-Bresson qui, qui sont souvent liés à la fuite du temps, euh, à la perte d'un moment, à, à quelque chose plutôt de l'ordre de la perte. Euh, il a beaucoup, euh, beaucoup parlé de ce que André Breton lui avait appris, euh, et, euh, que André Breton lui avait appris à fouiller dans les gravats de l'inconscient. C'est quand même des choses euh, importantes à savoir et ce n'est pas n'importe quel photographe qui pense comme ça. Et du coup, euh, cette notion de decisive moment, elle, elle, elle occulte tout ça. C'est vraiment très précis, très carré. Ça ne tient pas compte de, de tous les temps différents de la photographie. Le temps de l'inconscient, le temps du passé, le temps de la veille. Voilà, donc c'est pas faux, c'était claquant. On voit bien à quel point ils ne se sont pas trompés puisque finalement, c'est une expression qui... Qui, qui, qui est resté vraiment accroché à Cartier-Bresson toute sa vie, euh, mais qui est très réductrice. Et c'est un peu dommage. Et bon, c'est repris partout. Le pape de l'instant décisif. Enfin, c'est quelque chose... On dit une scie en France, en français. One of the limitations of the decisive moment, as beautiful as it is, the decisive moment being... Um, the moment where everything comes together, right? The content and the composition, the content and the form. And that, of course, is what photographers who are hunters are looking for. Uh, but really, there is a lot of beauty in the undecisive moment, on the weak moment, on in the photograph where, in fact, nothing seems to be happening because photography is not so much always about the one frame. Photography can be very much about the series, um, a series of the, the sequencing. Cartier-Bresson came from painting, um, and you could see that in his work. It was a very, he was very much into composition. Um, it was very much about geometry, but it was an instinct. And I think it would be a problem. I think it would be not a good lesson to teach students to look for that because it was instinctively he could see the triangles and the rectangles and all those things that came together in the frame. But the lesson that you can take away from Cartier-Bresson's life and career is that openness to the world and that curiosity. Mm -hmm. 